begin reading in verse 1. Now will I sing to my well-beloved a song of my beloved touching his vineyard. My well-beloved hath a vineyard in a very fruitful hill, and he fenced it, and gathered out the stones thereof, and planted it with the choicest vine, and built a tower in the midst of it, and also made a wine press therein. And he looked that it should bring forth grapes, and it brought forth wild grapes. And now, O inhabitants of Jerusalem and men of Judah, judge, I pray you, betwixt me and my vineyard. What could have been done more to my vineyard that I have not done in it? Wherefore, when I looked that it should bring forth grapes, brought forth wild grapes? And now go to, I will tell you what I will do to my vineyard. I will take away the hedge thereof, and it shall be eaten up, and break down the wall thereof, and it shall be trodden down, and I will lay it waste. It shall not be pruned nor digged, but there shall come up briars and thorns. I will also command the clouds that they rain no rain upon it. For the vineyard of the Lord of hosts is the house of Israel, and the men of Judah his pleasant plant. And he looked for judgment, but behold, oppression, for righteousness, but behold, a cry. I want to read verse 7 in the second part. Well, read for whole, whole of verse 7 one more time, then we'll pray. For the vineyard of the Lord of hosts is the house of Israel, and the men of Judah his pleasant plant. And he looked for judgment, but behold oppression. For righteousness, but behold a cry. Father, we do need your help this evening, not to just merely see a story or a parable, but Father, more importantly, to see you, to see into heaven, to see the God who is the God that we have been grafted into the true olive tree so that we can serve. And Lord, we need to see as well, not merely the country in which we live in, but Father, Your future plan for Israel. But God, may we also see application for ourselves from that same God who looks at men the same way. And Lord, may we see not only our country, but may we see ourselves as individuals who are responsible to You for righteousness, Father, for judgment. And I just pray that You would help us to understand these concepts this evening. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. My dad preached this passage of Scripture when I was probably six or seven years old. And I remembered um, I remembered he got his message out of the sword of the Lord. My dad um, was responsible for a church plant, sort of. Uh, he was a lay person, and there were the pastor of the church. There was some, some major problems with the church that he gotten saved in. He, my dad started reading his Bible, and he found out that uh, pastors are supposed to be the husband of one wife. And uh, they wanted him to play his rock music in the church, and he felt like that was something that he was separating himself from the world over. And that was a struggle for him. And then there were some other issues, and it came to a place where he said, you know, I need a place that believes what the Bible says. And there was another man in the church said, you know what, I have the same issues. and Let's start a church. And so my dad said, well, I'll find a facility and, and uh, I'll pay for it and I'll lead singing. And the other guy said, I'll preach. Well, my dad found a facility and got it all fixed up as a church and the other guy never showed up to preach. And so for quite a few years, my dad had to preach. And I remember a lot of times he'd go to sort conventions and conferences and things like that. And, and uh, write letters to different pastors to have, ask them for help with preaching. But he preached this passage of Scripture. I remember when he preached it when I was eight years old. It made no sense at all to me. And uh, the reason it made no sense at all to me was because my dad explained the story. He said, here's a farmer, and he's a man who wanted to build a vineyard. And so the first thing he did was found the best, the best fruitful land that he could find, found good land. They could good deal. We were from an agricultural area in Kansas. My grandfather was a farmer. My dad farmed. And so I understood you need good land. And then he explained that uh, he got all the rocks out of the fields and so forth. Well, my uncle out in western Kansas had rock issues. He had to get rocks out of his fields. I understood that. He put he talked about fencing it up. And I thought, well, yeah, just shoot the animals or whatever comes in. But hey, if you want to fence your vineyard, then go right on ahead. He explained all of it. And then somehow I missed the whole it brought forth wild grapes part of it. 
and I just picked up the tearing down the vineyard. I'm going to I'm going to take away the hedge thereof. It's going to be eaten up. I'm going to break down the wall thereof, and it shall be trodden down. And the tough thing for me was, why would you invest so much? As a kid, I'm just thinking, why would you put so much work into something and then just destroy it? You know, it's kind of like stacking all your dominoes up and having your brother come and, you know, hit the one that knocks it all down, you know? Or building your house of cards or whatever it is that you do and have somebody just destroy it. You know, I think I adopted some kind of a sinister take on the game of Jenga as a result of what happened to me in my childhood uh, from hearing my dad preach this passage of Scripture. But I didn't understand it then. I couldn't understand why God would build something, would make it so good and invest so much into it, put so much watch care into it, and then destroy it. The reason was because it wasn't worth anything. It didn't produce anything that was worthwhile. I want to look at some wording in, in this text this evening, and I want to, I want to have us understand tonight what God wants, what God wanted, from Israel and Judah and what God wants from us. I think that would be good application, wouldn't it? Uh, in verse 1, Isaiah is, of course this is from the Lord and Isaiah knew it was. Isaiah is prophesying and he's prophesying by way of a song. By the way, uh, if you can, and he, you, anyone could actually, you ought to try and read this in the Hebrew sometime because it's very, it's, uh, it, this is poetry, this passage of Scripture. It's really interesting. When you look at, it. we'll actually see a little bit of that, some of the alliteration that's in it, uh, in the message this evening. Isaiah says, "I will sing a song to my well beloved, a song of my beloved, touching his vineyard." Now, friend, it doesn't take a lot of uh, help for people that know who Jesus is to know who the beloved is and who the vineyard is. Uh, we get to know uh, what God is talking about. And friend, remember this. God's relationship with people has always been a love relationship. God's relationship with Israel and Judah has always been a love relationship. It is too bad, isn't it, that the law has such a bad rap? The law of Moses was given to Israel, and it was given to Israel as a recipe for blessing. It was given to them as an opportunity. If you, This is my way, walk ye in it. This is, this is how to live. This is what to do. And if you do this, God promised some blessing that anybody who wants to have the good things in life ought to say, hey, good deal. God promised an earlier and a latter rain. I love the concept of the Sabbath years or the, the setting aside the land every seventh year for rest. Who benefits by God saying, I'll take care of you that seventh year? if you'll just rest the land. Should we do, right? Isn't it amazing? God said, you know what? I'm going to bless you so much that you can let the land sit for a year and you don't have to work. And yet the people said, hey, I'm going to get, that, I'm going to get the fruit of the field one more year. And God added up all those years, and guess what? They had 70 years of captivity as a result of the 70 years that they didn't keep that year of rest for the land. It was a good deal to rest, but Israel acted as though God was taking something from them, keeping something from them. You know, God's allowing a man like Jacob to have the birthright was a real privilege, actually, when you think about it. Every time God has done something in, in any age and dispensation when He's done something with mankind, He's done more than anyone has ever deserved. So as we begin to look at this story and this, this song or this, if you will, Old Testament parable, I will sing to my well-beloved a song of my beloved touching his vineyard. My beloved hath a vineyard in a very fruitful hill. This is starting off like a great love story, isn't it? In other words, the idea is he's got a beautiful hill, a fruitful hill. He is one who loves his vineyard. And then we hear how it plays out. We, the, the story goes great. Verse 2, He fenced it. He gathered out the stones thereof and planted it with the choicest vine and built a tower in the midst of it. Okay, so He put the choicest vine in. In verse, uh, in verse uh, 7, the Bible says, the men of Judah are His pleasant plant. The vineyard, the Bible says, is the house of Israel. 
So here we see God in a very kind way referring to Israel as a beautiful hill or as a fruitful hill. He's referring to Israel in a very positive way, right? This isn't God saying you're lousy, you're no good for anything, and I, if I do anything, it'll be uh, in spite of you instead of because of you. He, he calls Israel and Judah, the, he calls Judah the choicest vine. He calls Israel a fruitful hill. And then the Bible says, he built a tower in the midst of it. So he built a place to watch, built a place of permanence, a place of protection in the, in the center of it. Of course, the tower would have been where the, uh, the husbandman would have spent his time. That's where he would have been as working out of. And so the, the, the picture here is even a picture of the temple, the Lord, or God's presence in Israel. But that last phrase in verse 2 is almost, it just doesn't belong in the sentence. The Bible says, He looked that it should bring forth grapes, and it brought forth wild grapes. In other words, on the basis of what it was, on the basis of what was done to it, this should have been the best vineyard. There should have been no comparison with it. It had everything that was needed. There was nothing that was lacking for it to thrive. And yet it produced terrible grapes. What it produced was not what was expected. And the choicest vine should produce something that's representative of the choicest vine. It wasn't so. And so now, God asked Israel and Judah to judge between him and his vineyard, verse 3. And notice that we change in the terminology. In verse 3, And now, O inhabitants of Jerusalem, men of Judah, judge, I pray you, betwixt me and my vineyard. Now God is no longer calling himself his well-beloved or his beloved. He's now saying, this is me and this is you. And so Israel and Judah are to know who God is referring to. He's referring to himself and his relationship with them. The questions that are asked, any of us could have answered. What could have been done more to my vineyard that I have not done in it? What's the answer to the question? Nothing. Let's get practical for a minute. What has God not done? What accusation could you levy against God and have anyone who is reasonable say, you know, you're right, God wronged you. You're right, God, God left something undone in your life. You're right, God is less than righteous and, and His judgment is not righteous. I wouldn't dare, would you? I've heard individuals before, and I've always shuddered at their audacity to accuse God of not being good. I'm always amazed when individuals have the audacity to say to a Creator God who has the right and is right and must judge the wicked and is only withholding that judgment because of His mercy to accuse God of not being good. Christian, you better watch it. You better be careful that you don't put yourself in a place where you're so far away from God that in your mind you would even <clears throat> think that God isn't good. God's good. And God asked the question to Israel and Judah, what more could I have done? And the answer is, you did everything. There's nothing that could have been done. And so God said, here's what I'm going to do. Verse 5, I will tell you what I will do to my vineyard. I will take away the hedge thereof. I'm going to stop the protection for you. Now, God, you've invested so much, you've put so much into it, why would you take away the hedge of protection? Does this remind anyone of, of, of uh, Jeremiah 7, 4? When the people of Israel said, the temple of the Lord, or in Judah, they said, the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord is at Jerusalem. You remember this? In other, the, in other words, the idea is, God's presence is in the temple in Jerusalem. And because His presence is in the temple at Jerusalem, then if God were to allow judgment or destruction or captivity to happen at Jerusalem, He Himself would be captive. In other words, God has to protect us because His presence is with us and it would make Him look bad if we went into captivity. And I believe that many times, I know for certain God's people Israel had the attitude 
that God has too much invested in us and it would look bad for Him if we were to be judged or if we were to go into captivity. You read Jeremiah and you look at how believable the false prophets were versus the prophets of the Lord that prophesied captivity because of unfaithfulness to God. And everyone believed the false prophets, and I believe the reasons that they believed the false prophets is first of all because they heard what they wanted to hear, but secondly because they thought that God had so much vested interest in Israel's blessing or prosperity that He would not allow judgment because it would make Him look bad. Christian, I want to remind you and I that God is right, He's righteous, and He's holy. And that what harms or makes God look bad is the testimony of those who do not respond in the right way to His goodness. We are backward, and I think somewhat more so than ever before, in the way we think toward righteousness and judgment. America is not Israel, make no mistake. We're not talking about replacement theology here this evening. I do not believe that the covenant promises to Israel are for America, but America has a history of worshiping the God that blessed Israel. And God has blessed America. And any person who would deny that is oblivious to facts, is a revisionist historian, and is unacquainted with reality. It's surprising to me how backward justice and judgment are today. For instance, I do not mean to be controversial this evening, and uh, I'm not being controversial, so I th if you think I am, you're the one with the problem, okay? <laughs> No one who is in the United States illegally is a good citizen. I don't mean to be controversial, but that's the truth. Now, I know everybody's thinking of that person. That's a good citizen that doesn't deserve to be stereotyped by me. But being in the United States illegally is a crime. It is not, as Jeb put it, a, an act of love. It's an act of selfishness. Uh, it's, an, it's an immoral act. And I'm not taking a moral high ground. I'm just lucky. I was born here. And so if I did the same thing, it'd be what it is, regardless of whom has done it. And I don't mean to be controversial this evening, so don't, don't walk away from me. I'm not trying to even get into politics this evening. But I want to help us understand things. Normally, when you have a discussion with the average citizen of our country and you talk about the criminal aspect, people want to talk about bad crime versus good crime. These people that are being deported, I mean, it's DUIs. <coughs> driving under the influence. I mean, they're going to deport them because of a mistake that a man made one night. Well, friend, an American citizen who drives under the influence it isn't a good guy either. I'm not making that argument. But we have a perverted sense of justice when we're more offended by somebody standing up in church of all places and saying that a crime is criminal. Because, friend, we do not believe in judgment. We think judgment is a bad thing. And I want us to notice something this evening about the character of God because I think if you think this way, you're unacquainted with how God thinks. And if you're unacquainted with God, how God thinks, could we just politely say your thinking is not right? And if you don't think the way God thinks, He's not the one with the problem. You and I are. Let's look at verse 7, if you would, real quickly. I could use illustration after illustration. I could use the illustration of abortion, but it's a little more sickening to me. It bothers me a little too much to sometimes even talk about. <coughs> I'm glad that we're not funding the murder of uh, babies in other countries. I wish we didn't fund the murder of our own babies. It doesn't seem fair somehow. It uh, doesn't even seem politically intelligent to murder our own and not murder others. But, uh, you know, taking the better of the high ground, it's, 
we have a perverted sense of justice when even Christians are treading lightly around issues that have to do with the taking of innocent lives. We have a perverted sense of justice. Verse 7. For the vineyard of the Lord of hosts is the house of Israel, and the men of Judah his pleasant plant. Look at this last phrase. There's a period after Judah his pleasant plant. We know who God's talking about, Israel and Judah. Here's what God wanted. And he looked for judgment, but behold, oppression. For righteousness, but behold, a cry. Mishpat, mishpah. He looked for mishpat, but behold, mishpah. It's an alliteration. God wanted righteousness, or He wanted judgment, but instead of judgment is oppression. The word for judgment is mishpat. There's 285 verses in the Scripture, and there's more than 294 times. You just click on Bible works, you can find that out. That judgment is mentioned. I do not believe that simply because something is uh, mentioned more times, there is a hermeneutic law that first mention and then times a thing is mentioned, of course, gives it a lot of force. I think that the Bible says that all Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable. And so I do not say that because something is said more than once in the Scripture or something is taught more than once in the Scripture uh, that it has more truth to it than something else. But I will say that the weight of the truth of judgment and as an attribute of God the importance of judgment, if it's mentioned 285 times in your Bible, do you realize that you could read about judgment one time almost every day of the year? At least more than two-thirds of the year? You could read about judgment? Friend, if that's so, and if in these instances, as I read not all of those instances this last week, but if in most of... Hey, Chuck, you're snoring. If most of these instances, if you uh, read about these things, then if these instances were talking about God and His character, then don't you think it matters to God? Like judgment may be somewhat important. In other words, God said, I planted a vineyard. I planted, I found the best land. I found the best plant. I did everything that I could to protect it. I did everything that I could to fertilize it. I did everything that I could to make sure that it brought forth fruit. And what I looked for was judgment. The fruit I wanted to be produced is judgment. We have so fostered a spirit of anti judgment today, then it's a bad word. Talk about judgment, judging, in any context you like, and it's a bad word, isn't it? Yeah. Isn't it? <laughs> uh, what is it? What is judgment? What's the idea of judging? That is discerning good or evil. Not having this nebulous, hmm, nothing's necessarily good or evil. In Jeremiah, God said, Woe unto them that call evil. Was that Jer that's, that's Isaiah, isn't it? That call, that's Isaiah. Woe unto them that call good evil and evil good. Judgment. God wants judgment. You know, it's amazing. There are things we don't talk about, right? <laughs> I've been just riling people up for fun lately. You know, I'm not a Trump guy. I don't. I don't. I think the man's immoral. He's doing a good job right now as president. Uh, he's, he may be the best president we've had in my lifetime. I don't know. I wouldn't have liked Reagan his first round either. You know, you got to be honest in saying I don't like him because it, this is some really wicked things. But I've been just messing with strangers lately. Uh, accusing them of being Trump supporters. It's a fun thing to do, actually. If you'd like to try something for entertainment, just go out on the town and just say, another Trump supporter. Just look at somebody and say that. And you'd be amazed. It's just really fun. Or it'd be really fun just to go to Taco Bell with Brother Al and watch somebody call him a Trump supporter. 
pause here, wake everybody up. Thursday night after Miami Beach, we were in, we were in Taco Bell, and this guy, loud, he's eating his meal, and Al just turns to look at him. He says, "You a Trump supporter?" <laughs> to Brother Al. So there he is, stereotypical uh, Trump supporter, right there. I was going to talk about something until I got off on Brother Al. <laughs> oh. <laughs> It's amazing, though, what people are upset about, isn't it? The things that, that people are upset about. So, so the other day, um, where was it? Oh, Best Buy with Mendy and my brother. We were waiting, we were looking, waiting for Mendy. And I asked a guy, I said, you voted for Trump, didn't you? It's a fun thing to say. Try it sometime. If you're not doing anything, you're waiting on someone. It's a really interesting response. And then act like you don't believe them if they say they didn't. So you, plot, you know, there's a lot of unaccounted for votes. You're one of them. I know you did. So I just accuse him. <laughs> this guy said, I don't want to talk about that. So I probably did vote for Trump. <laughs> so, I don't want to talk about that. So what, you're not going to shop at Best Buy if I voted for Trump? And so um, people don't want to talk about, they don't want to talk about like issues. They don't. No one wants to talk about, I mean, there, there are a lot of people that will throw, don't you dare talk about that statements out there. Women's rights. And don't talk about it because you're against something good. If you are, um, I have read so many great articles about Mike Pence being the most evil man in the world. And you read about it, you're thinking the guy's got horns and like eats babies or something like that. <laughs> but you find out that he tries to stop abortions. And that's why he's so evil. And the honest truth of the matter is, is as I read a passage of Scripture like this, where God says, I hate people calling good evil and evil good, it doesn't bother me so much that lost people are wicked? That's kind of appropriate, isn't it? What's amazing to me is that there's no judgment among believers. You know what I'm talking about? Those believers can't judge. They can't say right, wrong, good, evil. And God looked for judgment. He said, what I wanted from my beloved, what I wanted from my labor, what I wanted from my vineyard, was judgment. And he alliterated, he used two words that sound and are spelled in the original language almost the same. He said, I wanted mishpat, I got mishfach. And then he said, I wanted something else. He said, I wanted, I looked for judgment, but I got oppression. Oppression, my friend, the opposite of judgment is bloodshed, outpouring of blood. Isn't that appropriate? Then he said, I looked for righteousness, but behold, a cry. Now in the English language, righteousness and cry don't sound much like alike, but be the difference between Zedaga and uh, Zedaka. Zedaga and Zedaka. That's a tough one for me. Zedaka. So ga and ka will be the differences in the sounds. Almost the same word opposite meanings. Almost the same sound. Opposite truth. Righteousness. Read Proverbs sometime and do a study on righteousness. What happens when the righteous rule? People rejoice. What happens when the wicked rule? People mourn. They cry out. They cry. Friend, judgment and righteousness ought to be something we ought to pray for. Now I want to caution you a moment. There's a reason why judgment and righteousness aren't a big deal to us. It's interesting when God says, this is what I wanted from my people. If I had, before the text tonight, before the message tonight, if I had said, what did God want from Israel and what did God want from Judah? And if I had had everybody write it on a slip of paper, drop it in the offering plate, and I read it off this evening, what would I have read off? Name two things God wants from Israel and Judah. Two things that were important to God. Two things God wanted. Would you have guessed righteousness and judgment? It's interesting how far removed it is from the first thing we think of, isn't it? 
as I meditate on this passage of Scripture and I thought on it, I thought, Man, you know, that isn't the first thing I would have thought God wanted. And so, we don't think much like God does. And why is that so? Well, you know, I think the first reason is the real honest truth that if God is going to destroy the wicked, there won't be anyone left, including me. It's one of the reasons, isn't it? But you know, thinking along those lines gets us down to a point, and that is that we have sin that we're not willing to deal with. There are things that if we're going to get real about righteousness, we're going to have to get real at home first. And so we had rather just not emphasize that so much. Is it not so? See, when we leave our gift at the altar and then we go and make things right with our brother and that sort of thing, sometimes it isn't just not something right with our brother. Sometimes it's just, God's convicted me about this. I know it isn't right. A lot of times it's dedication. A lot of times it's just harboring things that have become idols in our lives and our hearts. And if righteousness were a thing for me to demand in my environment, I'd first have to demand it of myself. And that would be a little much, wouldn't it? You know, I'm praying that we'll begin to see revival this year. We need revival in our church in a bad way. We need to love the Lord like we just hey, we don't love the Lord like we used to. We need to love the Lord like we never have. There are so many things that have a place of priority over God. There's so many things. It's interesting. You, you could try, you could run an experiment on it, and you could you could graph it if you like to. You could just try to get someone to do something or try to get our church people to do something that you know God wants and just gauge the response to it and find out where God fits when it comes down to priority and loving Him. We need revival. It would be great to see revival in our church. It would be great to see it among Christians in the world. Wouldn't it? But the problem with revival, to be quite honest with you, quite frank with you, the limitations to revival a righteousness and judgment, and righteousness and judgment in a very rare, near sense. That is, if we're going to get real about what God cares about, it's going to start at home. It's going to begin here. And here, my friend, I fully understand why it is that God found the best vineyard, found the best hill. He wanted to bring forth grapes, but brought forth wild grapes. In other words, it wasn't that he didn't bring forth grapes, they just weren't any good for anything. It's small wonder that today, <coughs> that with our understanding of God, which I would have to say parallels, wouldn't you agree? Parallels the understanding that Israel and Judah had? I would say that we de-emphasize the same things that they did and that the same truths that are important to God are still important to Him today. And this ought to be a matter of prayer and soul searching, ought it not? This ought to be something where we'd say, you know something? This is what God cares about. I didn't mention this before, but it's very interesting to me that judgment is mentioned. 285 times in the Bible. I don't make anything out of anything that the Bible says when it comes to numbers. You ever have somebody, every number means something, and they write books about it, and things that nobody could ever know if you didn't make it up. You know, it's like, I don't, I don't want to study the grammar or do exegesis, so, you know, I'm just going to make up some stuff and write a book about it so people think I'm spiritual. That's what I feel about the numbers people. But it's interesting to me that the, that uh, judgment is used 285 verses in 285 verses of the scripture, and righteousness is also used 285 times in the scripture. It seems like there's rather much of a balance there. Both of those 
our major emphasis, both of those are almost universally in the character of God. In other words, referring to God or God's will. And God seems extremely balanced in the, the desire for righteousness and for judgment. So how do we finish our service up this evening? Well, I would say if it's the thing that God wanted from the people that God loved, if we are His beloved, it ought to be the thing that we give Him. Father, thank You for what You've taught us this evening. I pray that You would help us to understand it. And Lord, that You would open our eyes to this truth. Lord, may it be that this would be a key in our lives to our seeing Your hand, Your mighty hand of revival. We pray for it in Jesus' name.